All right, I'm Cody Tapscott. We're here with Julia Hub. Um, we've been thinking a lot over the last year about how to bring Julia to new systems and new places that it usually hasn't been deployed to before. Alan Tech is just one piece of that story, but we're really excited to talk to you guys about it. So I think uh, I'll pass it over to Gabriel here to talk more about the problem we're solving here. Okay. Uh, hey, I'm Gabriel, and let's dig into it. Uh, so what what is Alec Track trying to solve? Uh, basically, I think if you've written Julia before, if you write allocation-free code, reduce your allocations is a thing that gets drilled down into you a lot. And it's sometimes annoying to, f to figure out things like, what are is what is my code allocating? Where in my code are allocations happening? Uh, in, am I covered? Like, the, oh, I eliminated the allocations in part of my code, but maybe there is a corner case that actually allocates. How do I make sure that, oh, I made my code allocation free, but it can regress? Uh, and I think the, the cool thing that I think Cody touched in, like, oh, can I disable the GC because I have a, like a control loop that cannot be paused? So to disable the GC, you need, need to be sure that you're not actually allocating anything. And like to exemplify that, I have a little function here that just allocates some arrays and tries to build a histogram. Uh, I think Christopher yesterday made a sim similar thing. And you can see here that this function, each execution does 20,000 allocations, spends time in GC and whatnot. And we want to avoid that. So you have a couple tools. You can use, for example, the allocation profiler. This is the pprof visualizer for it. You can see it's not super easy to understand what's going on there. There is a bunch of things. And if you dig into it, you're going to find what's happening there. And it, it is very useful and should be used together with AlecTrack. But we think that AlecTrack is a nice place to start because it gives you something that looks a lot like a Julia error. So you can see here, for example, it shows that you have an allocation of a vector in 64. It gives you a stack trace, very much like a Julia error. So I think everyone's a bit used to seeing how these work. Uh, uh, and we have a couple errors. I think Cody can go a little bit deeper. Yeah, great. OK. So these are the three kinds of errors you have to worry about when you're working with AlecCheck. The basic idea here is that you're going to be using AlecCheck when you have code that you're pretty sure you should be able to completely eliminate the allocations from or nearly completely eliminate your allocations. And in order to do that, you're going to have to solve a couple of the other problems as well that are also part of good hygiene in the case you're able to get this kind of highly efficient um, dynamic dispatch free code. So the three kinds of errors here, um, first of all, the problem we're interested in, of course, are these allocations. That's what inspired us to write this package to begin with. And these, in the most conspicuous form, are, are these kinds of things where you're creating a mutable struct or allocating a vector, or, uh, or maybe you're just accidentally in some branch of your code you have a cache that you're using, but there's a chance you might resize the vector inside that cache. That's a possible allocation that we need to consider, too. So we, we cover that case as well. But in order to get there, there are other corner cases we also had to consider. So there's stuff here that might look uh, fairly innocent, like a, just a type assert for an integer check. That might end up calling into subtype, uh, a function in the runtime here. And that inside actually uses malloc. So even though it doesn't allocate any Julia objects, it's still a problem for the extreme case that you're trying to run this in a hot loop with the GC disabled. We have to make sure we call that out for you as a possible allocation. The nice thing is that AlecTech will tell you, oh, this is a, an allocating runtime call rather than an allocation of a typical Julia object. So you can say, OK, the problem here is that I'm calling subtype. That's probably related to the type assertion here. And then you can kind of figure out how you can get around that issue. And, uh, and to be clear, not every type assertion is a problem. But type assertions with poorly typed arguments often are. So if x here happens to be inferred as any, then this can end up as a runtime call. Whereas if x is concrete, usually the compiler will just figure out that that's always true, and you've got no issue here. And then finally, dynamic dispatch. I think everyone who works with Julia is kind of familiar with this as a concept. Um, but AlecCheck makes, makes this kind of like a first class concern, because if you've got a dynamic dispatch, the problem here is that we don't know where these function calls go. And I can't make any guarantees about code that I don't know is going to run or not or where it comes from. So uh, first place requirement in order to be able to, make, be able to guarantee that your code is going to be allocation free is that we have to be able to make it sufficiently type stable that all dynamic dispatch is gone. So you'll also see in the output from AlecCheck, you'll see errors that say, this is a dynamic dispatch. We don't know whether the other side of that dispatch allocates or not, and so we're going to have to flag it to you as an error anyway. Um, all right. And then with all that in mind, I think we can go back to our example here, and Gabriel can talk about how you're actually going to fix it now. Right. So 
I think there are multiple ways of fixing allocation examples. Here I took a very simple approach. We had that example. Uh, we can see here that we're allocating uh, an array on each loop iteration, and I think uh, the first thing, the first two people will say, oh, well, pre-allocate, uh, and that's what we did. So uh, I made a ran history room fast that just takes in a scratch buffer that would be reused across calls. So you paid this allocation cost once at the beginning of your of your program, and we can see that this function now has one allocation, which is the return of the function that we could also potentially save, but that's instead of 20,000, one is a lot simpler. The GC isn't stressed about it. Uh, and yeah, that's a simple thing one can do, and AlloCheck would help you to do it. So for example, this, uh, Oops, this error would go away uh, in Alec check. Uh, and yeah. Yeah, so I think the, the key thing to take away from that example too is that this case is pretty clear. I think probably all of us had, have had an experience where we uh, have some Julie code that looks like this. We stare at it for a little while and we see the allocations and lift them up. This is easy, but the idea is that Alec check can help this even if it's hidden in some library you're calling in or if it's hidden in some if check that is hit in some test case that you didn't, that you didn't happen to cover. So we, we provide this kind of reasoning, but for more complex code that you might not be directly staring at. Um, and so now, with that in mind, with the basic use case, we'll get into some of the more complexity here. One thing to keep in mind of, which AllocCheck doesn't yet help you very much with, is that there are really two types of allocations. I think people often have an experience with the allocation profiler, where you look at the results and you say, okay, it points to this line. There's no allocation there. What are you talking about? But there is an allocation there. I mean, we are allocating, but you didn't write the allocation. You didn't create any struct. You didn't create any vector. You didn't resize anything. So the question is, where did that come from? That's what, what we're trying to kind of explain here. Um, because Julia is a high-level dynamic language, it gets to make decisions about, for example, whether a tuple is going to live on the stack or on the heap. And whenever it first puts something on the stack and then decides, oh, actually, uh, the situation has changed, and all of a sudden this object needs to be moved to the heap, that becomes a late, like a deferred allocation of that object. So that's what, what is happening here, for example. We have a tuple that normally could live on the stack, but because you put it inside a, field, a poorly typed field of a mutable struct, um, then all of a sudden we need to move this to the heap. And so it, that tuple gets copied to the heap in this code example. There are a couple different ways to fix this. Um, first of all, you could use mutable types to begin with and make sure it starts on the heap and stays on the heap. The other way to fix this is you could uh, make sure that that field is sufficiently well typed that we can just say, oh, that's a tuple of int int. I know exactly how large that is going to be, and I'll just reserve some space inside that struct. I don't need a separate pointer to it, so there's no copy that needs to happen. Um, but that's some of the, the extra complexity that you can get into here in terms of uh, copies that can be kind of invisibly inserted by the runtime. So this is something to watch out for. We have some ideas about, to improve, about how to improve this, but we'll come back to that later. Um, and then Gabriel here is going to talk about some other common pitfalls in terms of the kinds of issues people usually run into in their code. Yeah, so like using Alec check, we've found there are typical cases where you, you can get some allocations. One of them is simply you make an extra copy or an, a struct that maybe you could have been uh, a, a immutable struct. You made it immutable for ease of use, and now you have an allocations in your code that are unnecessary. Uh, Alec check has a couple. We call it's not exactly a false positive, but it's a really rare positive. So broadcasting has a check that if you alias the arrays you pass into broadcast, it has to make a copy. But that's not common. But Alec check will flag, hey, by the way, you can have an allocation here, and you run time or the allocation profiler, and you don't have an allocation. And we have some ideas that maybe we could try to identify those. But in essence, even if it's in a corner case, Alec check will flag it. And an optimization that's interesting is that Julie can elide an allocation, but if you have an implicit return to your function, like in the, in the example there, because you're returning the object, we have to allocate it. So be aware that maybe you put a return nothing there, and then the optimizer is able to remove that allocation. Uh, yeah. yep. Great. And then to close, we just wanted to mention that uh, we're about we're happy to say that we just updated this for Julia 1.11. So you're ready to try this out on the latest RC if you'd like. And then in the future, the main thing that we'd like to fix is what we talked about in terms of these runtime inserted allocations. We want to give you a hint about why they're there and uh, separate them from the ones that you wrote explicitly in your own code. Um, so yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, um, I imagine there will be quite some questions. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, given that it's the last session, we'll have 
yeah, uh, three questions, no more, but I believe that you can catch Cody and Gabriel right after the session, yes. right? Yeah. Okay, so uh, first question. Yeah, I see the hand there. Thanks, really cool tool. Uh, what are your thoughts on LSB and Static Analyzer or Linter integrations? Uh, so I think Electrack maybe could be used uh, on it, but it's probably not the right tool because Electrack works at a very low level. So if we, f we believe it's more of a testing tool that's something to inform your code in, in your IDE. I think there's two talks that are gonna happen in the afternoon that work at a higher level. Basically, it's difficult to translate whatever Electrack finds to something in Julia. Sometimes it, it's easy, but usually you've seen those cases where you're putting a tuple into a mutable thing, and I don't think we can really get that information back to an IDE and into an LSP protocol like JET or something built on top of like a Julia level static analysis would be able to do. Yeah, I, th I think the biggest uh, challenge that jumps out to me is that uh, Alecheck needs to still have a decently well-typed um, entry point to your function. So you have either an explicit signature that you give it that you say, I want to check any subtype of this signature is going to have no allocations, or you go ahead and late mark your function with at check Alex. We didn't show that here, but that means now, you know, Julia naturally, if it does a dynamic dispatch into that function, it'll say, okay, you called this at runtime with int float32, int8, something like that. And then for that specific specialization, it'll go ahead and check that that particular specialization is allocation free. Often that check is a lot more uh, precise than something we can do if you just check integer, integer, abstract float, for example. Okay, uh, more questions? Great, uh, one here. Thanks for the talk. Um, very basic question, but how do I actually use alloc check to check if my function allocates? Yeah. Uh, there's two functionalities. They're both called check Alex. One is a macro that you put in front of your function, and it like uses generated functions to make sure that that function doesn't allocate at runtime. And there is the like code typed. I think it, we're based on code type. There's a macro version where you put your function and some arguments, and there is the non-macro version of it that you just put the function in a tuple with the type of the arguments that also works. And both of them do th basically the same thing. One just happens to do it when you call the function. The other is, is like a compile time check, if you m might think about it that way. And both of them, like if you're used to add code type or add code warn type, the usage is exactly the same. Yeah, the, uh, the at version of code type is something we kind of, uh, that kind of form where you put it on the call site is something we want to add, but it's not in yeah. there right yet. So that's one thing you might find missing. But other than that, the usage to be very similar to, to code typed. Um, and you can also add it as a decorator on the function declaration. Okay, that's going to be last question yeah. for uh, this session. Yeah, probably similar question. Is this something you put in your unit tests? I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? Is this something you would like to put in your unit test? For example, you've optimized it, and then you can put this check as a unit test yeah, to make sure it doesn't fall over? Uh-huh. The, um, the two cases that we considered kind of primarily here uh, Gabriel alluded to one, which is that you might have a long-running hot loop where you really need a hard guarantee about allocation freeness. In that case, that's really what the use case for this sort of at, at check Alex function declaration was designed for. It guarantees you can't get into the code at all unless it's allocation free uh, once you're inside, which means you're, you're safe to turn off the GC, for example. The, um, the other use case, which I think a lot of users will use when they just kind of want to make sure they've got good hygiene, but they, uh, but they don't have hard requirements on, like they don't need to avoid the GC for correctness. They just want to do it to have good performance characteristics. In that case, yeah, I think adding uh, examples to your test would be a very common case. Another case that we want to explore in the future would be the chance to mark your function as uh, whoever ends up calling this function, whether it's in a test or it's in production code, enforce that it's allocation free. And with the extra caveat that, of course, it might throw a, uh, an analysis failure error or something of that kind. But that's still exploratory. Uh, to, your, to your question, I think SciML is using quite a few of Alecheck unit tests basically to make sure that their solvers and other loops do not allocate. So that is a supported workflow and I think one of the main workflows we, we aim to support. Awesome. Yeah, with that, we're going to close the session. Thanks a lot for all the speakers and participants.